الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيب مبارك فيه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه جميعين Indeed, we praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessings be upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon all the messengers who preceded him alayhim salatu wa sallam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh dear brothers and sisters uh, First of all, all praise due to Allah and lastly, all praise is due to Allah azawajal and also, I would also like to thank uh, the brothers and if there's any sisters involved in arranging the set of talks this week uh, does it come under uh, a theme that you have for this week or revival, revival week um, so may Allah reward all the brothers and sisters involved in that I mean okay so the title that has been given is conversing with your Lord <laughs> conversing with your Lord um, it is a title which maybe to some seems a little informal conversing with your Lord because uh, you know you converse with your friends you converse with your colleagues you converse with a number of people so how is it that you converse with your Lord does it, is it, a same, does it have the same approach well whether it is an, a formal or an informal kind of approach the fact that we are talking about uh, ourselves talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the context or the scenario or the whole setup really should define the whole mood or the understanding of what we mean by conversing with our Lord now conversing with our Lord how we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how we address Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creator and our Lord now <clears throat> I want to begin with uh, stating that there is a particular manner there is a particular way that we will speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is a hadith which is in both Bukhari and Muslim in which the, the companions may Allah azza wa be pleased with them all that they were raising their voices in making some dhikr and some dua they're raising their voices then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said to them all Go easy upon yourselves. Make it easy. Because whom you are addressing is not the one who is heedless or deaf. Rather you are addressing the one who is the all hearing, the all seeing. So this hadith tells us what? This hadith tells us that, that yes, that the Prophet, uh, rather the companions, may Allah Azza be pleased with them, all, were addressing Allah Azza wa with dhikr and dua. But the way that they were doing it needed to be corrected just slightly. For this reason, the Prophet ﷺ said, Go easy upon yourselves, there's no need basically for you to raise your voices. So there is a manner and that there is a way that you will address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the time which even if a person is heedless, you know, throughout the daytime. The mere fact that they will offer their five daily prayers, that is what at least one particular time, five times of course, that they will have a dedicated time that they will speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will praise Him and they will ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala for the needs that they have. So throughout the 24 hours in the day, the majority of the time, that Muslim may be quite heedless, doesn't you know, think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doesn't make much dhikr, doesn't make much dua. However, they do offer their five daily prayers. So within this time, it is even more important that when you or that person is addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it is at a level or in a way which is respecting and honoring that moment. The importance of prayer is not the topic. However, I'm sure that you are, most of you are all aware, most of you, that the prayer is the first thing that you're going to be asked about when you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your deeds. And that if your prayer is good, that everything that follows will be good. And if there's deficiencies or there is problems in your prayer, that what follows, then, well, you know, the person will be in a difficult position. So the importance of prayer is a long discussion. 
and I'm sure that the point has been made. So therefore, how you will contact or how you will address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this special time is of the utmost importance. It is establishing one of the pillars of the prayer, uh, of Islam. Establishing the prayer. Now the prayer, when you look at it, is made up of a number of components. You can look at it from different ways. And for most of us, for most of us, we do concentrate, sometimes maybe more, on the outer aspect of the prayer. To ensure that we are facing the Qibla, facing towards Mecca, uh, that we are in a state of purity, that we are wear wearing the necessary clothes, and that if I'm praying in a jama'ah, we try to ensure that our rows are straight. Okay? So externally, most of us, pretty much, things are in place. We focus on where we're going to place our hands, when we're standing in prayer, when we're going to sujood, we focus on that, we should at least try to focus on that we are prostrating properly. Uh, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, we are commanded to prostrate on seven parts of our body, our two knees, our two feet, our two hands, and our forehead, including the nose. And how often discussions, straight after salah, straight after the prayer, that they begin with, this, you know, talking about the outer aspects of the prayer because you would like to correct them or to advise them or to even ask them about the matter that maybe you've never seen before. But it's all concerning the external part of the prayer. And the statement of the Prophet Wasallam, pray as you have seen me praying, shouldn't be just focused on the external part of our prayer. Even though maybe we do focus on the external part more than we need to. Not to say that we don't ex, you know, uh, focus on the external part of the prayer because it is an honor. It is an honor and it is one of our great objectives when we offer our prayer that we pray externally in the manner and the way that the Prophet ﷺ prayed. But really what does go under uh, or passes us passes many of us by is the the inner part of the prayer and that is essentially the essence because when you are you know prostrating or you're bowing or you're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if your mind is somewhere else then these actions really just are just actions and maybe don't have much value because it is important that you have presence of heart and presence of mind while praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you conversing with Allah Jalla wa is not confined to the prayer. But I'm talking about something that all of us, we can say that we engage in. Without any doubt inshallah ta'ala, the fact we are Muslims, we engage in the prayer. So it is a, a starting point for all of us. So let us, if you like, uh, talk or address the matter of conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the prayer. So many of us, we don't necessarily focus on the inner part of the prayer, the essence of the prayer, if you like. Us having you know, our minds and our hearts present to ensure that when I'm offering this prayer, that the prayer isn't just merely actions or just bodily movements. The Prophet ﷺ informed us in an authentic hadith that you will find people that when they offer their salah, they will be next to each other. Some of them, that their prayer will not be accepted from them. Some of them, their prayer, they may receive ushur. They may receive a tenth in reward. Some of them, they may receive rubr, maybe a fourth, a quarter. Some of them may receive half. Some of them may receive a full reward for their prayer. Even though, in terms of their bodily actions, they performed all the pillars and the obligatory acts of the prayer, all the sunan, however their minds were, not present at all. There was no presence of heart. So it was just merely actions. So, why is it that we have become so fixed and focused on the external part of the prayer? And that we don't necessarily focus on the inner part uh, of our prayer. I'm sure there are a number of reasons. 
it's easy for us to look at the external part of the prayer. It's very difficult for us to judge whether that person has presence of mind or heart. We can't judge that. So when we're talking about the issue, it's easy for us to start talking about the external part. Another issue is that sometimes you find people, if you start talking too much about spirituality, start speaking about matters of the heart, maybe that person has a particular mindset and feels that, you know, I may be... Uh, although, alhamdulillah, those barriers and those misunderstandings, it's incorrect to think like that. Uh, at one particular time, thought maybe speaking about spirituality too much, maybe people will think ill of me, that I am from a particular way of thinking, which is completely wrong. Another reason why we don't focus on necessarily, if you like, the inner parts of the prayer, what is said in the prayer, is because I don't have much knowledge. I don't really think about what I say in my prayer. I don't really understand what I'm saying in my prayer. Now, if you find two individuals who speak two different languages, however, they're very respectful to one another and they're helpful to one another. However, when they speak with one another, <coughs> they cannot understand each other at all you'll find that there is a big gap. When we are addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course the example has some partial resemblance, of course Allah jalla wa ala understands everything. There's nothing that passes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by. But ourselves, when we say the Arabic in our prayer, and we are you know, making the, the opening dua in our prayer, how much of that I understand? And even if I do understand, let's say for example, I'm, you know, Allah blessed me to some extent that I'm an Arab native speaker and that I can understand what is being said in the prayer. But at a further level, do I ever ponder over actually those words? Do I ever think about really what these words actually mean? And I think, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is best, for us here in non-Muslim uh, non -Muslim or non-Arab speaking countries that the biggest barrier for us not really focusing on the really inner parts of our prayer i.e. that what we're saying in our prayer is because that we just simply don't understand it when we read the Quran the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the vast majority of it I don't understand it in the language that was revealed I am completely reliant on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then I am reliant on somebody translating the meanings the meanings of what they have understood from the book that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I guess when you put it like that I that I'm a Muslim I believe in the Quran I believe it to be the final revelation I believe it to be a miracle from many aspects, from many different views. However, I don't understand it. It's quite damning upon myself if that's the way it is and that I don't really want to do anything about it. If a person has a sincere and good intention that they want to change that situation, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no doubt can make affairs and make their situation easy so why is it that or why should a person be satisfied why should we be satisfied in praying five times a day saying all of these words that by you know by the vast majority but I don't really know what I'm saying is it good for me uh, and a good example is in Ramadan uh, during Taraweeh when there's Qunut when there's Witr right at the end and then the Imam is making different types of Dua there's at the beginning he is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now you know when you say Ameen when do you say Ameen? does anyone know what Ameen means? Ameen means Allahumma stijib oh Allah answer what I'm asking for However, the Imam is saying, he's praising Allah, Antal Malik, Antal Quddus, 
Anta Khaliq Samawati wal Ard, you are the creator, you are the one free of error and free of anything that, that the creation may associate with you. And they're saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Oh Allah, answer this. Oh Allah, answer this. There's nothing to answer. The Imam is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, then when the Imam says, and there's something common to them, that there's Jannah, then they say Ameen at the right time. So this is a common example which proves not just to say, look, people don't know, Muslims don't know what they're talking about or what they're listening to, they don't understand, or maybe to some extent true, but is an example to prove my point. In that for the majority of us, in our prayer, the reality is that maybe we don't understand enough of our prayer as we should have, or as we should understand. And it is a shame. It is a big shame because the prayer, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would would always go to prayer. If any matter bothered him, alayhissalam, that he would go to prayer, as Aisha radiallahu anha narrated. And on many or on one occasion, he said to Bilal radiallahu anhu, "Arihna bissalah ya Bilal, give us comfort with the prayer, O Bilal, that he would make the adhan and then they would go to prayer." So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba and those who followed them with righteousness and, and goodness would always find a particular feeling or would find something special within prayer that they would not find at any other time. So what is it that they would, or what made them feel this, this way when they were praying and that they wouldn't find it at any other time? It goes without saying that they understood what they were saying. It goes without saying they understood what they were saying. It doesn't mean that when you read people of, you know, stories of the people of the past, that every aspect of their prayer, that they were ulama, that they were great scholars and could give great tafsir concerning any ayah that they would read in the Quran, in their prayer, or the opening dua, or the tashahud, they would give you the, you know, the finest details in its meanings. Not necessarily. <clears throat> However, what they would have is at least a basic understanding of what that they are saying. And they would in turn have a deeper understanding of whom that they are addressing. Because imagine if you are addressing Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the worlds, whom you recognize as your Lord, your creator, your sustainer, and the sole one who is deserving of all worship, that you understand the words that you are saying and how you are addressing him. So if we just look carefully, and I want to go through some examples of some of the common things that we say in our, in our prayer. And just for us to, to ponder over the importance of really knowing what we are saying when we are conversing and addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because even, subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in an authentic hadith, لا أحسي, لا أحسي That I am unable to really praise you and give you the praise that you are deserving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the Prophet alayhi wa sallam, who was the most eloquent of people. That he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam admitted that I know that you, Allah jalla wa ala, more deserving of praise than anything I can possibly say. Be that as it may, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in teaching us the prayer, as we should focus on the outer aspects of our prayer, we should likewise focus on the things that we say and the thing, the feelings that we should have, the khushur, the tranquility, the presence of mind and heart, to ensure that the experience that any one of us has during the prayer is not something that can be matched by anything. And it doesn't become a burden. That if the prayer is a burden to somebody, it is very difficult for them to offer their prayers, then there is an underlying issue. Then there's a problem that needs to be addressed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't uh, establish worship upon us for us to dislike it, or for us to hate it, or for it to become a burden, and a constant burden on our shoulders. Of course, there are aspects of our worship who may require sacrifice. 
like you're giving money or giving charity or something like that. It may be difficult for some. But the prayer is something which really no one should say that the prayer is really heavy. If that is the case, then there is, there's, a, there's a fundamental problem there which needs addressing. So when we look at the prayer, even before you reach the prayer itself, that the, the person is preparing themselves for a great moment. Because from the moment that you hear the event, from the moment you hear the call to prayer, that you are repeating what the what the, then is saying. And you're saying that Allah is the greatest, you're testifying, declaring your uh, allegiance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Muhammad alayhi salam is the messenger of Allah so you are constantly reminded about the prayer and that what you are about to undertake and then when you face and about to begin the prayer with your hands raised beginning with Allah is the greatest no matter what you face in this life no matter what anybody has that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner, the king of all of that, and is greater. And what he has, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in reward, is far greater than that what you can find in the dunya, in this world life, even if you bring it all together. This may have, to some, a real meaning. That when that person offers two rak'ah, two units of prayer before Salat al-Fajr, that they have a full certainty that is خَيْرٌ مِنَ الدُّنْيَ وَمَا فِيهَا that is and has uh, is better than anything in this earth and that anything that you can find in it and I want you to remember the next time that you believe that you've been granted something from this dunya whether it is a house a car a husband a wife or a child or whatever it may form it come in, comes in know that that two rak'ah that two units of prayer that you perform before Fajr is better than that. The reward that was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that is better than anything that you can find in this dunya. So the moment that the person begins their prayer by stating Allahu Akbar, what do you do now? Because you'll notice that throughout your prayer at every movement that there is something for you to say. There is a presence of mind, a presence of heart, that, and a state that you should be in. So, after saying that Allah is the greatest, what is it that you say? The vast majority, the vast majority may begin with a particular type of dua. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did he introduce to us, did he teach us only one? It's called an opening dua. Dua al istiftah. The opening dua or the opening supplication of the prayer. Is there one way that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to teach us? No. There are many ways. There are a number of authentic narrations that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to open his prayer four or five different ways. The shortest one is... One that many of us know. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarak asmuk wa ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayruk. Is the shortest one. This particular dua is purely, purely praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything. So you have begun the prayer in a state of purity, it, you're praying in its time, you're ensuring that you're wearing the correct clothing. So even before you have, you know, begin praying, there's a number of conditions that you have fulfilled, that you are respecting that prayer, that you don't approach the prayer in any form or any manner. There's many things that you've already fulfilled. So why would, if after fulfilling all of these conditions, then that the person would just race through the prayer? There's something wrong there. The person has to ask themselves, why have I gone to all of these, you know, to all this extent for them, me just to just blow it all away if you like, or not really pay attention to this particular act of worship. So, 
that particular dua that I mentioned to you is, and it is narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and it is found in Sunan Abi Dawud, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to open his prayer like this. The most authentic, the most authentic narration that is narrated back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he used to open his salah with is um, a dua which is about three or four times longer than that one I just mentioned. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. And it begins not with just praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather this one involves that you are asking. That you are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, <coughs> well I'll explain it now inshallah ta'ala very briefly. And it is Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khataya kama ba'adta bayna al mashriqi wal maghrib. That, oh Allah, make a distance or keep far away my sins, my mistakes, as far away as that you find the east and the west. Allahumma naqqini min al khataya kama yunaqqa thawba li abyadu min al dennis. And, oh Allah, purify me from my sins just as the white garment is purified from any filth or dirt. Allahumma aghsilni min khataya bithalji wal ma'i wal barad. And O oh Allah, clean me, purify me of my sins with like thalj, like with ice. And with ma, with water, with barad and a cool, a coolness. So throughout this particular dua al-istiftah, that there is a focus on your sins. There is a focus on your shortcomings. So therefore you're asking Allah so, and you, in three different ways. Because the concentration is on your sins, your mistakes. Oh Allah, keep them away from me. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, purify me. Just as the white thobe, the white garment is purified. And purify me as well with water, with thelch, with ice and with cool air, with coolness. So you open your prayer acknowledging your mistakes and your shortcomings. <coughs> this is the most authentic narration back to the Prophet ﷺ concerning the opening of the prayer. It is narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now maybe this is a dua that I don't know. This particular dua al-istiftah, I don't know it. The first one, I know it. The second one, maybe I know it. Maybe I know the second one and I don't know the first one. Another common one, a well-known one, is even longer than that. Which is found in Sahih Muslim. And it is a jama'. It is a bringing together of both a fana'u ala Allah to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for you to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the needs that every single one of us that we have. It is also an acknowledgement which is a form of praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have turned yourself to the one who created the heavens and the earth and that you are not from the ones who worship idols. That your prayer, your sacrifice, your life and your death that belongs to the Lord of the worlds who has no partner. And because of this, that you are from those who submit to him. That you alone are the king who has no partner and that you are my Lord. And that I am your servant and that I have wronged myself and that I openly admit to my sins up until now you're acknowledging and that you're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only now that there is that you begin asking فَغْفِرْ لِي ذُنُوبِ جَمِيعًا so forgive me of all of my sins because there is no one who forgives sins except you guide me to the best or the best of manners. There is no one to guide somebody to the best of manners except you. And keep me away or keep those things away from me 
which are harmful. Because there is no one to keep these bad things away from me except you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I answer your call. All goodness, all blessings, all bounties are in your hands. And that evil is not to be from you. That I myself seek refuge in you and I seek salvation from you. That you are the ever blessed, the ever high and glorified, that I seek you or seek forgiveness of you and that I return to you. This was just a very quick like, translation of, of that long dua al istiftah. But if we just ponder over, we're not going to do that, but if just we have time, and if any one of you has the uh, Husn al Muslim, the, the fortress of a Muslim, you'll find these different types of dua, uh, duas uh, in that for you to ponder over their meaning. So, number one is to memorize them and to know their meaning. Otherwise, complacency complacency can fall in but I will just say the same same dua really not pondering over it and by our own nature complacency can easily come around can easily occur because you're doing the same thing the same routine and because you're doing, doing the same thing you expect the same thing to happen and you can become oblivious to that what is around you or really what you are even saying so, changing, changing the dua that you will say in your prayers will encourage you to concentrate that little bit more on what you're saying. And if it pushes you to concentrate a bit more in your prayer, that can only be something which is good. Now, if a person is suffering from waswasa, whispers in their prayer did I do this did I say this did I say that maybe a big contributor is because they're, they're saying the same thing all the time and because they say the same thing all the time they can't remember whether they actually said it but if you find yourself that you're saying different supplications you're changing them you'll be concentrating that much more the Prophet ﷺ informed us that when the adhan is made, that the shaitan, he runs away. He doesn't want to hear that. And then he comes back. And when the iqama is made, he runs away again. And when that is then completed, he comes back and tries to busy ourselves and tries to remind you with the most important things to you. The most important dunya, the worldly things to you. Whether it is your family, your children, your wealth, your work, whatever it may be. He will try to distract you from you concentrating and getting the most out of your prayer at that particular time. Is it allowed for you to join more than one dua al-istiftah? Yes, it's allowed for you. So for example, you wanted to begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying subhanakallah wa bihamdik wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayruk which is purely praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you wanted to say Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bayna khataya kama ba'adta bayna al-mashriqi wa al-maghrib or Allah distance me from my sins just as you had distanced the, the east and the west you wanted to do that then of course that's absolutely fine and then after that after that that you will begin reciting al-fatiha which every Muslim recites 17 times a day at least 17 times is the very least do you know how many more times you may recite Al-Fatiha how many more times do you think you may recite that a person may so a person wants to do 100 okay they may do 100 but what other Sunan prayers can you offer throughout the day does anybody know another 12 you can add another 12 like I add 2 before Fajr 4 before Dhuhr another 2 after Dhuhr Two after Maghrib and four after Isha. Which is how many? Fourteen, yes. It's two after Isha. You with me, yes? You with me? It's two after Isha. Five. So that's another twelve. 
Any other sunan during the day? Any other sunan? Asr. Sorry? Four before Asr. Four, yeah, if you want to pray four before Asr, yes, you can. Excellent. It's not like the stressed, stressed 12 that I just mentioned, but of course it's recorded authentically. Any other? To hate the masjid, yes, that's another. To hajjud in the night time, if you offer that, yes. Whether it's eight, twenty as you like, sixteen, thirty-six. Yes, brother. Al duha. How many rakat? Two, four, six, eight. Good. Any others? After the uh, then. After then. Yeah. Between the then and. <laughs> we'll talk after, brother. Yeah? <laughs> Any others? Sunnah uh, Sunnah Wudu. Yes. The two after. Huh? Ishraq. Very good. Uh, after sunrise. Two. Yes. Any more? Where are the Hanafis? Where are the Hanaf? Where are they? Two before Maghrib. Two before Maghrib. Six after Maghrib. Uh, well, it's okay, it's okay. It's, no, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good. When the adhan goes, it's a hadith in Sahih Muslim. See how easy, easy people just to start accusing people, see? Once one starts, it's okay, everyone's going to go. No, there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that uh, the companion's name escapes me, that he entered the masjid and the adhan had gone. He, due to the amount of people praying, he thought that the jama'ah had actually started. So, it's a time for you to pray before uh, Salat al-Maghrib now. Any... Six after Maghrib. Sorry? Six after Maghrib. <clears throat> uh, if you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we can talk again, brother. Uh, no, it's, it's an opinion if you like, but possibly yes. Uh, Witter, anyone? Yeah, Witter. Witter, yes. If you count these up, how many times do you think you're going to recite Al-Fatiha? <coughs> Maybe 50, 60, 70 times a day. And each time that, because in Al-Fatiha, that there is a dua. And an explanation of Al-Fatiha, well, you know, uh, we can speak for a long time about uh, the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha, the greatest chapter. But you know, the, at the very least, we should say that we really need to understand what is being said in, in Surah Al-Fatiha because it has such great meanings. In fact, the whole of Islam, the whole of Islam, in essence, is found and explained in Al-Fatiha. Everything. Everything from submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following Allah's commands, you seeking and looking for salvation only by worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wanting to remain on the straight path, not, not, not wanting to be misguided, many things. So, again, with Al-Fatiha, it begins with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the Lord of the worlds, that He is the most merciful, the most beneficent, that He is the owner, the king of the Day of Judgment, that he alone do we worship and he alone do we seek aid. And then only then that you say, Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. And then after Al-Fatiha, you say, Ameen. Oh Allah, answer that supplication that you, have, that you have made. You are then permitted, if you like, then to recite another surah, another chapter of the Qur'an. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that especially with the night prayer, that he would make it very long. And as one of the companions, anhu, that he said that the Prophet began reciting Al-Fatiha, al then he went onto Al-Baqarah, and he maybe thought that he would maybe continue for 100 ayat. But then he, sallallahu alayhi wa continued. And then he went on to An-Nisa. And then Ali Imran. Three long, long chapters. And then he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went into ruku'ah. Now the ruku'ah, the bowing that he made, alayhi wa was as long as it took to recite those chapters. And then he stood up, alayhi wa sallam, at a similar time. 
and then he went into sujood alayhi salam for a similar amount of time. Now imagine what is being said. Now while you're standing, you're busy with recitation. You're busy with recitation or listening, at least pondering over the recitation that you are, or what is being recited. What about in the ruku'ah? When you go down into a bowing position, what is it that you're going to say? What is the best thing you could, you could possibly say? What's the best thing? What do you think? When answering this question, and in Islamic, any, any Islamic question, when anybody asks you something, what do you think is the best? Ask yourself one question. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do or say concerning that? Because that's what's best. Is it the obligatory act? Hmm? The obligatory? Well, if you say it's obligatory, yeah, some say it's not obligatory. But what's the best possible thing that you can say while you are in a bowing position? Yes, but what's the word, do you, what is it that you say? What's the, what, 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 what do we all say? Subhana Rabbil Awdah. That's the best possible thing that you can say while in ruku'ah. Because that is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us. And that's what he used to do. Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. It's not the only thing that he Alayhi Salatu used to say. But that is the one thing as we find and is a when Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the ayat in Surah Al-Waqi'ah in verse uh, number 74 فَصَبِّحْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said اِجْعَلُوهَا فِي رُكُوعِكُمْ That make this said in your ruku' While you're bowing, glorify Allah Azza wa Jal And how that was said سُبْحَانَ رَبِّي الْعَظِيمِ Glory be to Allah Al-Awzim Al-Awzim The when you have Arabic terms, uh, and these are the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Hul Awdim. When you put it into English, you miss out so much. Al Awdim from the word Adama, which is something enormous and great and magnificent. Subhan means what? Glory be to. It's a straightforward translation. Yes. But does it have a deeper meaning? Does it have any linguistic added meanings to that? Essentially, when you're saying subhanallah, let us go to the Quran. And they say that Allah took a son. Subhanallah. Glory be to him. Now, what is the link? That they said that Allah took a son, so glorify to him, glory be to him. Or is there something more than that? Yes, there is something more than that. Subhanallah, subhana, is that you're saying Allah is free and away from any deficiency any shortcoming concerning him subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he's free of that. He's far above that. And they said that Allah took a son. Glory be to Allah. He is far above taking a son. In no need of a son. So when you say subhanallah, you're freeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not because that he needs that, but you are acknowledging, testifying, declaring that Allah Jalla wa'ala indeed is free of, from any naqs, from any deficiency or shortcoming. Say, Subhana Rabbi al Awdeen. Subhan, that he is free of any deficiency or shortcoming. Rabbi, that he is my Lord. What does that mean, that he is my Lord? 
Because that's a straight, straight, straight translation. Rabbi, my Lord. What does it mean when you say that he is my Lord? What are the connotations to that? What is attached to that? Number one, that you are affirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Khaliq. Because Rabbi, you are affirming Allah's Lordship. Are you not? When you read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to, uh, to the Lord of the worlds. To Allah, the Lord of the worlds. The Lord. It means that He subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, Al-Khaliq. And that He subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Raziq. The sustainer. And who al Malik. And that He is the owner. Wa mudabbiru al-Amr. And the controller of all of the affairs in the universe. Four things. The creator, the owner, the sustainer, and the control of all of the affairs. Subhana, Rabbi, my Lord, al Awdim, the magnificent, the great, the almighty. So when you say Subhana, Rabbi, al Awdim, and you know, or you can attach some meaning to that, it has some meaning to you, and you know what it is worth, if you truly knew, and truly understand what it means, I think it will be very difficult for a person just to go into ruku' for them to bow themselves down, because for us bowing down is a sign of humbleness. That you don't do it to anyone. And for Muslim, you don't do it to any of the creation. That is only for Allah Jalla wa'ala. So if you put yourself in that position, and then at that time that you will say those words, I think, believe, and Allah is best. It's very difficult for a person to put themselves in that position, understand those words, and then just to rush through it. Just to say it once quickly, and then get out of it. Go up again. And then when they raise themselves, Sami Allahu liman hamida, Allah he is the one who praises him. Allah he is the one who praises him. If that person was in the Rukur and rushed through those words, did they say them properly? And then they are then saying, Allah he is the one who praises him. Can they ask themselves, did I truly praise Allah? While I was in the Rukur, did I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even the Prophet والسلام, said that I am unable to praise you duly. I cannot give you what you are deserving, O Allah. And that is Al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now for us, whatever position that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, needless to say, and if that was the state of the Prophet ﷺ, that's the things that he used to say, then what about myself? So, Sami Allahu liman hamida. And at each movement, you are remembering that you're saying Allahu Akbar. And then you go into sujood. You're going to prostration. And while in prostration, you can't possibly put yourself any lower. You put your, your face on the floor. What is it that you say? Subhana Rabbi al-A'la Glory be to Allah. Now we know what Subhan means. It's not just glory, but we know what is attached to that meaning. Rabbi, He is my Lord, the Creator, Sustainer, Owner and Control of the Universe. Al-A'la Complete contrast. The complete opposite of what you are doing. You are lowering yourself to the low, on the floor. And then you are now saying that Allah is the highest. <coughs> Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. And it's important for us to ponder over what is being said at the particular times of prayer because they have a great meaning. It wasn't just because it just came together like that that the Prophet wasallam received this as revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how to pray and what to say in the prayer. He didn't just make it up himself, So there's a great wisdom. There is a great wisdom 
in this. So as you place yourself on the floor, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, recognizing that Allah is the Most High. Fi thatihi wa fi sifatihi. In His essence, Subhana Wa Ta'ala, in His names and attributes, wa qadri, and His estimation, Subhana Wa Ta'ala. So again, at this particular time, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that the closest an abd, a servant, will be to his Lord is that when he or she is prostrating. That you should ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for whatever you want, whatever that you are in need of. And not necessarily everything that you think that you need is of benefit to you or is good for you. So when you make dua, when you supplicate, then you should be very careful and choose and have you know, a measured approach when supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the best things to say while in sujood? The best things to say are those that are authentically narrated back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the best things that you can say while in prostration. Then if you from yourself you want to ask for particular needs, then you can ask for those needs. Now, I assume maybe the question, or if we have some Q&A a little bit later, can I make dua in my own language while in prostration, while I'm in sujood? Wallahu alam, there's a khilaf, there's, there's a difference of opinion, well, there's a difference of opinion on most issues. However, on this point, it seems what to be more correct that if you're going to supplicate and make a dua, then you should really say it in Arabic and you shouldn't say it in other languages. That doesn't mean that you are mahroom, that you are prevented or you have been you know, denied that opportunity to supplicate to Allah Azza wa Jal because you can make a dua to Allah Azza wa outside the salah, no problem. But the salah itself, the prayer itself is something which is a special time that you only offer the prayer in a particular way. So when you're going to ask for your, for whatever you're going to ask for, maybe I haven't memorized that or don't know how to say that in Arabic language. At the very least, at the very least, everything that you're going to ask for, everything that you want, will essentially lead you to one place, that's what you want at least, will take you to one place and keep you away from another. That's essentially it. Even if it is you want a new car, or you want something from this worldly life, that if you do receive that, it will make you happy, and that in turn, if you are happy, that you become you will become thankful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And if you are thankful, then that will be something that will, inshallah Taala, bring you closer to what to Al Jannah, and keep you away from the hellfire. So even though you you may only know Subhana Rabbi Al Aala, and that's the, one of the most beautiful things, the most beautiful thing you can say while in sujood, while prostrating, then you can memorize, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-jannah wa a'udhu bika min al-nar. Very simple. O oh Allah, I ask for the paradise and I seek refuge in you from the hellfire. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised a very young companion who was paying attention to the Prophet alayhi wa in great detail how he would prostrate he'd spend a long time in sujood he'd be questioning and asking I can hear many things that you're saying I can hear noises but you know I haven't memorized that what can I say so the Prophet said to him he said, what, what, what do you say he said well you know I ask Allah for Jannah and I ask Allah to protect me from the Nar he said everything that I'm saying goes back to these two things so there's a starting point for all of us. That even though I may only know Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, that's okay. That's what's required of you, Alhamdulillah. But if you want to add something to that by simply saying, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-Jannah. Four words. Oh Allah, I ask you for Jannah. Wa a'udhu bika min an-nar. Three, another three or four words. Eight words. Nine words. Write it down. Try to memorize it. 
and say that while you're in sujood. This will help you add things to your prayer. This will help you become more conscious about that what you are saying while you're in your prayer. And then there's you, you come up again for the you know the remaining rakaat of the prayer. But there are so many other types of supplications that you can make while you're in prayer. So much that you can improve. So much more that you can add to your prayer so that the prayer becomes an experience that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Bilal Arihna bisalah Give us comfort. Give us some happiness with the prayer. That will have more meaning to you. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in, 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 in tranquility and in knowledge and in presence of mind and heart in, in all of our prayers. Allahumma. And so when you're conversing with your Lord, the fact that you will understand what you are saying, then you will have that ability, you will have that chance to, to have a relationship with Allah Jalla wa'ala. Because it is said that as Muslims that you have a very systematic, a very harsh, if that's the words that are used, a very dry way of living. However, if one looks very carefully at the type of relationship that, are, that the Prophet ﷺ had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for that matter, all of the Prophets that you find are mentioned in the Qur'an, how that they would supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be small issues or big issues, they would immediately turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he has a very famous book. And this book talks about the plans and the plots of shaitan. It's not called Talbis al-Iblis. That's Ibn al-Jawzi. This book was, is called Iratul al-Hafan fi Masayid al-Shaitan. Ibn al-Qayyim, and this, he's got one particular chapter in this. And he says, rahimahullah, <coughs> when talking about the servant and our servitude and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and wanting protection from you know the dunya or the shaitan that the servant will only truly feel satisfaction or feel and know that the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very close to them when that they know that everything that is harmful the cause of harm everything and the, the creator the creator of harm and the creator of good is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu khaliqu kulli shay. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. That only when that the servant truly recognizes this, this and knows this, that whatever happens in their life, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there soul is the sole direction that they're going to turn to. Whether it is the smallest thing that they need, even though that they know a person, they can just simply ask them for it, and the person may give it to them, that they will turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and make things easy for them in the hajat and the needs they have. So if somebody's harming you, somebody's oppressing you, somebody's doing wrong to you, how are you going to get out of that? Allah Jalla wa'ala is the one who decreed that for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is testing you. So therefore it's not the first port of contact. It's for me to go to that person to sort out what you're doing to me. Why are you doing this? I didn't do nothing to you. Let's sort this. No. The first thing that that person will do is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to alleviate that oppression. To remove that difficulty that has been placed in front of them. If that then means that you have to go to the creation in some way and to resolve that problem to remove that problem then, then so be it but the first point of call in all of their matters in the seeking of good and the protection from any harm is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they realize in that they know the one who gives benefit 
and the one who's going to trial and test and make things difficult for you, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the relationship that the true servant has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a direct relationship. It is not something that involves us having to go through intermediaries, to go to people, to go to the creation in any shape or form. That the door is open, that the Qur'an is very clear. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ That if my servant asks about me, asks you about me to the Prophet ﷺ, tell them I am Qareeb. I will answer the call of the caller when they are calling. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَا اللَّهِ أَحَدًا And that the places of worship, that they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَا تَدْعُوا So do not call upon other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a Muslim, if they understand this uh, relationship, they will have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is closer than any other person on earth who may follow another way or follows another path. Because other paths involve you going through something or asking something from the creation. Whereas the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires you to go direct to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without anything else. So you will have the closest relationship. But the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you to have a relationship with Allah azza wa your creator, which brings you closer than any other path. And then when you look at the life of the Prophet alayhi wa sallam and the, the, the Sahaba and the Prophets and Messengers that are mentioned in the Quran, you'll find that they had the closest relationship. You'll always find them Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything. Even, subhanallah, anything that they could do themselves, they would want to do it themselves. They wouldn't want to ask anyone else to do anything. They would want to be, after Allah has given them the ability, to be self-sufficient. If I can do something myself, I'll do it. That is the kind of people that they were. They wouldn't kind of, the one kind of people who would be asking, pass me that. If I could do it myself, that they would do it. I'm not saying that you can't ask. If you wish to ask, ask. It's okay. But they were the kind of people that Allah blessed them with the ability to do things so that they wanted to do it like that. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us or have the ability to want to follow the best of mankind. Ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from anything that may take us away or may harm us in this life and hereafter wa sallallahu wa sallam barak ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in is there a four raka'a sunnah before isha okay the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us an authentic hadith that there are ithnata asharat raka'a there are twelve raka'a that whoever prays them in any one day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for them a baytun fil jannah okay and they're the stressed sunnah that I mentioned. Two before Fajr, four before Dhuhr and two after, two after Maghrib, two after Isha. Other sunnah that may happen to be during the day, maybe at a specific time not, not to do with those twelve, like Duha in the morning. Or for example, the two sunnah after Wudu. Or for example, uh, Al Witr. These other uh, sunnah that were mentioned. If one wants to do that, and there's a uh, a text for that then okay whether it's a stressed sunnah or not if you want to just pray some nafila a voluntary from yourself then you're free to do that after maghrib I want to pray some sunnah okay it's fine after um, after dhuhr I've done my you know I've done my four before then I prayed my fad and then I prayed two I want to pray some more rakaat it's okay nafila then that's fine uh, the dua at the end of the tashahud it is, only, is it only accepted in the fad prayers or does it apply to optional prayers as well? Well, if there's a dua in any prayer, then we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it from us, whether it be a nafila, a voluntary, or an obligatory prayer. <coughs> Wallahu ta'ala. Is the dua of a non-believer accepted? Taib, good question. It can be. Give that to me. Um, <clears throat> there's a hadith which is in it's an authentic narration 
which is in uh, Sunan al-Bayhaqi, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to fear the supplication of the oppressed, even if that person happened to be a non-Muslim. So if a non-Muslim was oppressed by a Muslim, for example, and that non-Muslim, you know, some said something to alleviate the oppression because of the wrong that was being done to them, then Allah Jalla may answer that. But that is muqayyid, that is restricted uh, uh, concerning that. Uh, uh, when is your dua most likely to be accepted? Well, that there are certain times in which the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, encouraged us to uh, to make dua because it, would, it is hoped that uh, that time is uh, is more likely that Allah Jalla may answer that supplication. For example, the time between the Adhan and the Iqama. It's a good time to make dua. Also, um, while it is raining, likewise on the day of Al Jumu'ah, after Salat Al Asr, the last hour, it is also a good time to. Uh, time to make dua. I said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, "Pray as you have seen saw me praying." So why do we say at uh, tahiyatu in the prayer? Okay, because yeah, no, the point I think is being mentioned. We say assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabi. Is that what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said? He praises himself. Well, <clears throat> there were times when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, did things, showed us things min bab ta'alim because he's teaching us because that is what we're required to say okay so if this is the case like anything else where Allahumma salli ala Muhammad would he say that about himself? yes he would alayhi salatu salam because this is what he was taught and he has revealed this, so then we say that in turn. Okay? Is it possible to attain 100% khushu' in prayer? I mean, what do you judge khushu' by to say that I've achieved 100%? I don't know, wallahi. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to say that if you... Can I receive... I mean, you, Allah Jalla says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah Azza as much as you can. And that is what you will be, inshallah, you know, judged or rewarded by to do your best. And what should somebody do if they find their mind wandering uh, sometimes during the prayer? Well, a, a couple of things. The Prophet ﷺ gave us an advice that if somebody or the, something comes, not somebody, something comes to your mind and it is distracting you, then you can spittle over your left three times. Okay, to remove the waswasa or the thought that may come to your mind, or for you to think about. Maybe to concentrate back on what you are saying, because you know what you are thinking, uh, uh, what you are saying rather should bring about a consciousness and understanding of what you are saying, and seeking refuge uh, in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, from a shaitan. You know, in, when the Imam leads the prayer I mean, five times a day, why do certain prayers you have to read, you don't read out loud, and in certain prayers you do read out loud? So, um, no. For example, Makri, we read out loud. Zakarah. Okay. There is no. Uh, the, the question was heard. The some of our prayers are said out loud, and some are said quiet. Is there essentially is there a wisdom? Is there a reason behind that? Yeah. It wasn't explained to us by the Prophet ﷺ. Essentially, as, uh, the, the specific reason is there some hikmah behind that? Some scholars have mentioned some hikam, some wisdoms behind that, which would be their own ijtihad, their own kind of like reasoning, if you like. Uh, but we don't have anything specific to say, this is, you know, uh, the reason why. Therefore, it's just something ta'abudi. It is just something that we were taught like this, and, uh, and we follow it like that. Allahu uh, Akbar. While in sujood, are you permitted to uh, make dua, the duas from, that you, you find in the Qur'an? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed us that he said, "Nuhitu an aqra al-Qur'ana 
في الركوع والسجود اللي هي اليس كما قال اليس هي واز بروهيبيتد فروم ريسايتينج ذا قران وايل ان ركوع اند سجود سو وات عائشه رضي الله عنها نريتس كان يتاول بس هي وود تشينج بيكوز ذير ار سيرتن سبليكيشنز ذات ون ماي ونت تو تو ساي So what you would, he alayhi would do was change one word so that it is not considered the Qur'an. Okay? قَالَ رَبِّي حَبَّ لِي مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ It's a simple dua in the Qur'an, yes? Oh Allah, grant me, give me somebody, a dhurriya, progeny from the salihin, from the righteous. So you say in the ruku' اللهم change it slightly, اللهم You change it slightly, so not considered the Qur'an. So that can be done. And that is what the Prophet used to do. Yes, two questions. Um, okay. First one, is there any uh, nullifiers during the prayer? So no, can you just go through any quick nullifiers in the prayer when someone, for example, like showing at the back one? Yeah, I mean, nullifiers of the prayer, um, speaking during the prayer, Other than that, it would nullify your prayer. Exposing your, uh, your aura during the prayer, okay? Nullify the prayer. Uh, losing purity would nullify your prayer, okay? So, things like the conditions of the prayer, if you think about the conditions, they have to be fulfilled throughout the end, till the end of the prayer. Like facing the Qibla, uh, you remaining covered, praying in you know, purity, things like that, okay? So that's a good indication to say that yeah, these could be possibly nullifiers. Okay? Yeah, the second question is um, after the prayer, huh? making dua, is that a bid'ah or is it fine to. <coughs> making dua? Yes, after, after prayer? After prayer, constantly. Ah, constantly. Tight. Um, there's two ways of answering this. And albeit the more diplomatic answer, I still think gives us the correct answer. I believe this is the correct answer. Okay? And I would say that concerning ibadah, concerning worship, that doing what the Prophet Alison taught us and how the companions, how they would understand how ibadah is to be offered, of course they're not ma'sumun. They're not sinless, they may do things which may be incorrect, but by and large, if they do actions and it's agreed by their companions, then do that. Now, anything which is done consistently and all the time, which maybe the, the, the Prophet didn't do, the companions didn't implement that, it's best to avoid it. It's best to avoid it. Because then it may become something which is inherited and it carries on and carries on, and it becomes like a sunnah. It becomes like a sunnah. Araft? So, is it a bid'ah? If I decided I want to make dua, personally, after every single prayer, do I do that, raise my hands? I don't. But if I did, is it a bid'ah? No, it's not bid'ah. The point is that if a person believed this is something I need to do after the prayer, and it wasn't legislated for us, then it, it can become a bid'ah. But if a person just wants to make dua in this manner, then they're free. Is there a recommended way of making dua? The structure, good question. Uh, some of the ulama, or many of the ulama, I should say, really, mention that yes, there is an adab, that there is a, a manner that one begins by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praising Him, calling upon His names and attributes, and then you would ask for your, for your need. Okay? So just as with the creation, if you had a need, you had a hajjah, You wouldn't just necessarily just go to them and say, yeah, give me this, I'll need that. You may want to say something nice to them, praise them. You know, it may come across a little bit rude if you just come say, oh, give me that. I, want, I need this or I want that. So, you will approach a human being in a particular way. Allah is more deserving of that. So, it is good to begin with, you know, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Al-Fatiha, for example. You know, the fact that when you ask Allah, oh Allah, guide, us to be, guide me to this guy, or guide us to the straight path. That is only said after you have praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from the very beginning of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us. 
There's a methodology in, in supplication. If a person did just say, you know, just throughout the day, and wanted something without praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not that we're going to say it is haram, or it is not allowed, it's a rejected dua, no. no. But we're saying it's preferable, it is better to, to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning. When you're in the prayer, do you have to look at the point of sujood? Mm-hmm. Or because some people say they prefer closing their eyes to concentrate, and yeah. some people say they prefer looking around. Yeah, okay. And others say it helps them. Now, I'll say the question again. It's it's, uh, it's worth a second time to say. <laughs> and it is. Uh, I just remember the funny bit. Sorry. Um. Just start again, those again. <laughs> Some, people Some people say about, about you know, where you should be looking in Salah. Some say you should be looking at the point of prostration. Some say that you should look ahead. Some say that uh, you know, in front of you. Some say that you know, I prefer, I, I feel better when I close my eyes. Some say I prefer it when I'm looking around. <laughs> that was the funny bit. And uh, yeah, okay. Well, in general, the, 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 the ulama say it is preferable to look at the place of prostration because that is what is understood from the actions of the Prophet <coughs> to attain khushu' to attain tranquility and calmness in the prayer to look at the place of prostration if it's looking around it, you know, you're taking in a lot of information as I'm, you know, I'm looking at you here there's lots of different people there's, you know, it's a lot of information I'm taking in so I'm multitasking so in prayer the less multitasking the better you want to concentrate as much as you can on the prayer. So, by looking around, no doubt, you know, you're going to distract yourself. So, anything that will distract you from the prayer is disliked. However, in Mecca, some of the scholars, they make, a, they make an exception. They do make an exception. And say that, while if you're in the masjid itself, it's permitted for you to look at the, the, the Kaaba. Okay? So, if you're looking at the Qur'an channel and you see all the people that are like, like that and they're saying that he's got no khushu' or she has no khushu' then there are many of the ulama they say it's permitted while over there that you can look at the Kaaba. Okay? Other than that, really you should look at the place of prostration. Wallahu a'lam. Okay, um, notes, papers and other documents or paperwork which has the name of Allah Azza written on it, what can we do with it? Can we just throw it away? Uh, no, you shouldn't just throw it away. Because anything with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on it needs to be respected. So the way of uh, destroying it is really if you can find something to burn it. Okay, then uh, that's, that's a permissible way to... Um, to get rid of that. Is there such thing as a selfish dua? I mean, no, if you're asking th- something for yourself which is beneficial to yourself, that, that's fine, that's okay. It's benefit for you to... To gain a closeness and reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's fine. You don't have to ask 